Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 75, August 22nd to August 28th, 1862. Last week, we had a little setup for us here, but we will go much more in-depth when talking about the Battle of Second Manassas and the campaign moves that led us to the three-day struggle. We did have a good chunk of content on the Dakota War of 1862, moving beyond our timeline to talk about those events. Keep in mind as we move forward that this is ongoing and will be at least in part draining some resources away from the main theaters. And as I mentioned in the episode last week, we may take a look at some of the events a little bit more in depth that are in the immediate aftermath of the initial conflict we spoke about. Just as a quick announcement before we get started, the episode has been posted to the Patreon feed about Bill Fletcher's memoirs, Rebel Private Front and Rear, and he does mention some events that We will actually talk about tomorrow. He's there at 2nd Manassas with the Texas Brigade. They do play a pretty large role in the battle. So if you want to pair that very nicely with the episode that we're going to be rolling out next week, I think it's a good companion to it. So the Patreon feed is in the description. And once again, of course, your support of the show is greatly appreciated. This week, I want to spend time to really set up the Battle of Second Manassas, or Second Bull Run. Eventually, Lee is going to find himself back at the site of the first large-scale battle of the war. For Jackson, it would be a well-timed homecoming, as he had undergone a less-than-stellar performance during the Seven Days. In the shakeup that followed in the Army of Northern Virginia, Jackson would keep his role as the left-wing commander and enjoy the same confidence he had received from Lee. I think it is telling that Lee did not simply regard Stonewall as a kind of one-hit wonder with his Valley campaign. Lee would rely heavily on Jackson, especially as he attempted to destroy Pope. John Pope, on the other hand, was in a weird spot of indecision. He was slowly being reinforced with troops from the Corps of Burnside, as well as the Army of the Potomac. Heinzelman, with his two high-performing division commanders, Kearney and Hooker, were on the scene, and Porter had arrived. Other troops were on the way, but McClellan was doing a good job of dragging his feet. McClellan, of course, does not like Pope, and that feeling is actually shared by many of the subordinate officers from the Army of the Potomac, most notably Fitz John Porter, which is sort of going to turn around and bite him in particular. So we will actually see that happen here after the battle. There was not a very good organization in rail traffic, which led to some confusion. Jacob Cox and his men arriving from western Virginia had a specifically hard time linking up with the rest of the army as a result. Still, the situation was positive. Pope had numerical superiority, and his line precariously extended beyond that of Lee. You see, Pope wished to not be cut off from Fredericksburg, as he had set up shop around Warrington along the Rappahannock. While it was true that Pope had fallen back from his line on the Rapidan, Lee would see that it was only a matter of time before Pope decided that he had enough numbers for an advance. Working against the clock, Lee would need to deal with the Army of Virginia quickly or risk the Union making good on their attempt to take Richmond, and we already know exactly how Robert E. Lee feels about losing the rebel capital. 
Lee would wish to make Pope as uncomfortable as possible. It would start with Stuart. Stuart was still smarting at being almost taken prisoner, narrowly escaping capture after his miscommunication with Fitzhugh Lee. Fitzhugh, of course, is the cousin of Robert E. Lee. Rooney Lee, Robert's son, would also be under Stuart. As I mentioned very briefly in the previous episode, Stuart had lost his favorite hat as a result of the raid, which he had actually won betting against a Union officer in captivity. Receiving orders from Lee, Stuart would ride with 1,500 troopers in the night to a place called Catlett Station. Stuart's men were aided by the sounds of a thunderstorm, which masked them getting into position. On August 22, 1862, the encampment was taken via a charge from the rebel cavalry. They captured much in terms of supplies and around 300 prisoners. Destruction of the railroad bridge, which was another objective of the raid, was hampered by the wet wood not lighting on fire, but the damage was still done. Pope would have been shaken as a result of the raid. His own hat and frock coat were actually captured by Stuart's men, a fitting replacement for the one that Jeb had lost only a short time before. One particularly humorous episode involved a captured Union soldier who had bet a local woman a bottle of wine he would enter Richmond within 30 days. Heading there as a prisoner of war, the woman brought him his spoils, as he would indeed be getting there within the allotted time frame. Graciously, he accepted his winnings. Episodes like these would continue to win Jeb Stewart notoriety and fame. It would also continue the narrative that the cavalry in the Confederate Army was superior than that of the Union. It was true, Union cavalry in Pope's Army was in a sorry state. It would be some time before the Federals would be able to match the Southerners in the field. A major fallout from this event was that Pope would fear his flanks were too far exposed, as the raid by Stuart demonstrated. He would again pull his men back north, setting up a line around Warrington, waiting for the potential reinforcements to join him. An alternative of the raid was that it did hamper the supply to the Army of Virginia, as the whole living off the land idea was not going to feed the amount of men that Pope had gathered. It would be better to move back, wait for the proper reinforcements and supplies before moving again. Along the Rappahannock line, there had been skirmishing between the two sides, but nothing really to show for it. Lee again was running out of time. McClellan's army was already on the move to join Pope. Porter and Heinzelman had arrived, and Franklin was at Alexandria. Despite being outnumbered, he would decide to pull off an extremely bold move, and to do it, he would rely on Jackson. If you were to look at a map, and I hope to throw one up on the website so you have a better idea of what I am talking about, you would see a small range of mountains called the Bull Run Mountains that run north to south near Warrington. To the west of these mountains is a smaller valley before the Blue Ridge and then the Shenandoah Valley. Jackson was going to use a gap in these mountains called Thoroughfare Gap in an effort to flank the Union Army and come in from behind to destroy the supply bases at Bristow Station and Manassas Junction. On August 25th, this move would be put into motion. Remarkably, the Union Army was aware that there was a large force moving to the city of Salem, where they would turn east and head through the gap, flanking the entire northern host. But nothing was done despite this piece of crucial intelligence. Pope had a lot of different options, including attacking the now-weakened remainder of the Confederate army, 
which could blow up the plan before Jackson could get back to help. Additionally, there would not have needed to be too many men placed at Thoroughfare Gap in order to halt Jackson, so that was another way in which the Confederates could have been foiled. Longstreet, though, had moved his men into stretched positions, making Pope think that there were still the full allotment of Confederates on the other side of the river. Some artillery firing would continue the ruse. Pope would give Jackson valuable hours of march so that he could complete his objective. For many reasons, and some of which we have already described, it was a risky move, but it would pay off for the rebels. Jackson would move undetected to the rear of the Federals. By this time, Stuart and the cavalry had joined him and would screen his right flank as the army marched. Stonewall would strike at Bristow on the 26th and then Manassas Junction on the 27th. Supplies were either captured or destroyed by Jackson's men. Many would write about the amount of good food that they were now loaded down with. There are actually some accounts that I have read that essentially make this event one of the more memorable for that of Jackson's men, sort of a great memory of the war. In particular, I believe John O. Castler would write about this event and all the good food that he gets, kind of like a Christmas came early kind of deal. Jackson would stand by and wait for the inevitable Union response. Only four casualties have been suffered by Isaac Trimble's command in the assault. Alarm bells would be setting off for Pope after Jackson's raid. He would remove himself from the Rappahannock line, sending his men toward Manassas Junction. On the 27th, there would be two skirmishes conducted, one involving Joe Hooker and the other involving the New Jersey Brigade under Richard Taylor, on different sides of Jackson. You see, the problem was that Pope's communications had been cut with Jackson's capture of Bristow and Manassas Junction. Taylor's brigade was moving in a southwest fashion toward Manassas from Fairfax. His brigade, along with two Ohio regiments from Jacob Cox, were being sent to investigate the disturbance on the railroad. Colonel Herman Hopped, who was in command of the train traffic that was feeding the army, had come up with this idea. The infantry would secure a point further down the railroad so that at least part of the travel for the men and supplies could be done. Of course, there was no reason to think that this was not just another Confederate raid by Stuart's cavalry, or perhaps even partisans. Taylor would not have known that he was walking directly into Stonewall Jackson's men. These very same men were now in fixed positions that had been left over from the previous campaigning. The New Jersey regiments would spot cavalry, but would not realize the infantry and artillery support until it was too late. Taylor's brigade would be badly mauled and only stabilized by the support from the two Ohio regiments coming up from the rail line. 339 of 1,200 were lost, and Taylor himself was mortally wounded. On the other side of Jackson, coming up from the south, was Hooker's division, who would make contact with Ewell, who was posted as a rear guard. From wooded positions around a stream called Kettle Run, the Confederates would engage the Union troops and inflict heavy casualties. General Ewell would make sure to leave his men there long enough to check the Federal advance and use Jubal Early's brigade for an orderly withdrawal. This action would be known as Kettle Run, causing another 300 or so casualties for the Union, including men from the Excelsior Brigade. Jackson could not have been more pleased. Two Union assaults had been parried, but soon the full might of the Federal Army would be heading his way. 
Down further to the south, Lee would move with Longstreet in the same route that Jackson had took in an effort to join him. Because of his departure, this would free up Pope to focus all his attention on Jackson, who he believed was still sitting at Manassas Junction. A plan of attack would be unfurled, sending all of his corps commanders in an effort to crush Stonewall. Jackson, though, was not going to play nice and simply sit there while Pope moved his now organized army at him. The Confederate wing commander had started to move his men toward Groveton. Jackson, it seemed, had flown the coop. Pope would be attempting to locate Jackson on the 28th when the Battle of Second Manassas will begin. Let's take a little bit of time to talk about John Pope. Now, he really has not been in the East for very long, nor will he be. But because of that, we're not really going to get a whole lot of an opportunity to analyze John Pope because our events are going to overtake us fairly quickly, and we're going to have to fight Antietam before you know it. Pope is an interesting character. He is often villainized by both North and South. Part of this would be that he is widely disliked by many of his troops. We very briefly mentioned his opening address to his army, and it's one of those wow moments. It's like one of those emails that you get from a team member that essentially tells you that everyone has been doing everything wrong up until this point. But I do think it does give us a good idea of the kind of inspiration and the kind of attitude that Pope is bringing into this role. So let's go ahead and read it here. Let us understand each other. I have come to you from the West, where we have always seen the backs of our enemies, from an army whose business it has been to seek the adversary and to beat him when he is found, whose policy has been attack and not defense. In but one instance, has the enemy been able to place our Western armies in defensive attitude? I presume that I have been called here to pursue the same system and to lead you against the enemy. It is my purpose to do so, and that speedily. I am sure you long for an opportunity to win the distinction you are capable of achieving. That opportunity I shall endeavor to give you. Meantime, I desire you to dismiss from your minds certain phrases, which I am sorry to find so much in vogue amongst you. I hear constantly of taking strong positions and holding them, of lines of retreat, and of bases of supplies. Let us discard such ideas. The strongest position a soldier should desire to occupy is one from which he can most easily advance against the enemy. Let us study the probable lines of retreat of our opponents and leave our own to take care of themselves. Let us look before us and not behind. Success and glory are in the advance. Disaster and shame lurk in the rear. Let us act on the understanding, and it is safe to predict that your banners shall be inscribed with many a glorious deed and that your names will be dear to your countrymen forever. Now, was this a wise address? Probably not, as you can already gather, he has done his fair share of withdrawing. Additionally, he has given little thought to his line of supply, and that has already come to be an extreme negative here in this campaign, with Stuart at Catlett Station, and then Jackson at Bristow Station and Manassas Junction. We're going to see in 2nd Manassas, His disregard of holding these strong positions is also going to be an extreme negative. Jackson has a strong position, and he mauls Richard Taylor's brigade as a result of that. So there's already many red flags popping up throughout this address that we can start to analyze. Pope does often get the short end of the stick, though, and not all the criticism is fair. Was he qualified to command? This is questionable. I have seen it implied that he uses a shaky record with a lot of exaggeration and embellishment. 
and his personal relationship with the president to get where he was. He did have a win along the Mississippi, and he was decent in command during the Corinth campaign. Second Manassas does take away from these victories, and rightfully so. He does have a sort of disadvantage in quality of troops and commanders compared to that of McClellan, so there is that going for him. I have seen his main problem being that he has strategic tunnel vision. This will hamper his performance on August 28th. We have actually already seen this kind of tunnel vision, and I've seen multiple historians from the sources that I have seen criticize Pope for his move going toward Jackson that we just talked about. Like He thinks that Jackson's just going to kind of play ball and sit there and wait for him until he gets there, which obviously when you have an enemy who is as aggressive and a dynamic general as Jackson, that's not going to be the case. But because he lays out this plan, and this is the plan, and this is how it's going to unfold. Then it's kind of surprised when Jackson's not there when his troops finally get up there. Following Second Manassas, he will be a problem for the Lincoln administration. From last week's episode, we actually spoiled what happens with Pope, so pretend that you did not hear that, at least until after next week. We're going to go ahead and close this episode by talking about the action at Thoroughfare Gap. Now this is actually going to take place on August 28th. August 28th, I know, is this week technically, but while this is going on, there is action at Groveton, which is also called the Battle at the Bronner Farm, which does kick off Second Bull Run. So, as a scheduling note, I will be talking about Thoroughfare Gap But next week, we will stick with the date of the 28th and see what is going on at the same time at the Bronner Farm. Now, on August 28th, Irving McDowell will seek to secure his left flank as they advance north. Part of this flank would be Thoroughfare Gap. Men under the command of James Ricketts' division will be given this task. Ricketts was a New York native and had commanded artillery in the army prior to the war. He's going to serve on the court-martial of Fitz John Porter after 2nd Manassas. Most likely, he's going to be denied promotion as a result from his vote in terms of the verdict. He will go on to command troops under Lew Wallace during the Monocacy Campaign. In 1862, Ricketts would not post his infantry in a strong position at Thoroughfare Gap. Instead, he sent his attached cavalry force there and kept the rest of his command at nearby Gainesville. Ricketts was a cautious commander, and his men were all green to combat, so it cannot necessarily be all his fault. Longstreet's men would make contact and scatter the cavalry at the Gap on the 28th. The Confederates had marched at a leisurely pace. Jackson was not quite in a sticky situation just yet, and Lee was confident his subordinate could handle things until Longstreet arrived. Ricketts would move his men in an attempt to meet the threat, but in a weird twist, some of his regiments were obstructed by felled trees the cavalry had placed to be an obstacle for the attacking Confederates. Longstreet was able to secure the high ground and repulse assaults from the Federals. Fighting was done in the gap, and skirmishing was conducted on the high ground to either side. As Ricketts had judged correctly, firing down into the gap would have had a devastating effect. His attacks repulsed, Ricketts would withdraw to a ridge line just outside the gap, which commanded the mouth. Despite the strong position, two brigades under Evander Law and Cadmus Wilcox would flank Thoroughfare and force Ricketts to retreat. The casualties were some 100 on both sides for the skirmish, but the implications on the battle would be vast. Longstreet, 
should have been denied the ability to combine with Jackson. Instead, Lee will have his whole army, and this is going to pay off handsomely on August 30th. I think we've done enough this episode to set up three days at 2nd Manassas. We talked about the movements that have led us to the battle, and mentioned a little bit about John Pope in terms of analysis. Next week, we fight the battle and get to see if Abraham Lincoln is going to be able to release his Emancipation Proclamation or scramble to defend the Capitol. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, as well as Patreon and Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated. Once again, feedback is welcome. Questions, comments, concerns, the email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening, and have a great week.